In its effort to combat human trafficking, Texas has created a multitude of task forces, coalitions, working groups, research groups, stakeholders, strategic partners, providers, and focus groups to address this issue. But no single entity has been focused solely on coordinating these efforts until now. Created in 2019, the Coordinating Council is a group of some of the top state agencies working together to coordinate and lead the human trafficking efforts across Texas. The Coordinating Council's work is comprehensive across all aspects of trafficking, from prevention to victim identification, investigation, prosec prosecution, rehabilitation, and beyond. My name is Emily Landon, and we are very excited to present this webinar series for you. Never before has Texas created a coordinated multi-system strategy to combat human trafficking. This strategic plan is a historic step in charting an end to human trafficking. We have broken the strategic plan into five separate sections on how to eradicate human trafficking in Texas. These five different parts include prevent, protect, prosecute, provide support, and partner. As you now know, each webinar will take place around 12 o'clock every Tuesday for the next few weeks. At each webinar, we will have a select group from each of the members of the coordinating council um, to serve as subject matter experts. And we have leaders as well as human trafficking survivors to speak on each of the sections. Today, obviously, we will be speaking about PREVENT. Today, we have a multitude of fantastic speakers, including Brooke Corona Robb from the Texas Attorney General's Office, Dimitri Mitchell from DFPS, Blanca, from DFP, DFPS, we have Catherine McLaughlin from DFPS, Anna Blake from DFPS, excuse me, Blanca Denise Lance from DFPS. Um, from HHSC, we have Brandy Souls um, from TDLR, we have Brian Cottle, and from the Human Trafficking Survivor Leaders Council, we have Becca Charleston. We will finish this webinar with a Q&A at the end of each session. So please post your questions to the Q&A tab and we will put your question in the queue. The Coordinating Council would like to thank everyone who has fought tirelessly against the crime of human trafficking. As we celebrated MLK Day yesterday, let us be reminded that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you all for your attendance and let us get started to eradicating human trafficking in Texas. Brooke, I'm gonna give it back to you. Thanks, Emily. So when the strategic plan addressed the issue of prevent, they came up with several aspects of the strategic plan. Um, the first uh, part of the strategic plan was to enhance community awareness. And so we're gonna talk about that first, but I wanna tell you what else is coming as well. Identify and address risk and protective factors, uh, reduce demand, assess the prevention landscape, develop statewide prevention framework and guidelines, reduce vulnerabilities and utilize school-based prevention education. I am hoping that y'all will tell us just a little bit about yourself before we start. So I have a poll, um, if you would answer and tell us about your organization and what area of the state you are in. All right, thanks to everyone who answered. Uh, we appreciate your answering. We have a good variety of different people from nonprofits, government or agencies, law enforcement and elected officials. Um, we are pretty geographically um, shared across the state. So thank y'all so much for being here. Brooke, I just wanted to cut in and, and recognize um, the comment that was just made um, regarding that there wasn't an option for healthcare providers on that poll. Uh, thank you for letting us know that. Um, there are some healthcare providers on the, on the line as well. Thank you. We are so glad to have you with us. I just realized that I need to reshare my screen to handle a technical thing. So let me do that real fast. All right. Thank you. So when we talk about human trafficking, 
uh, and enhancing community awareness. We realize that with this variety, uh, the various people that are on this uh, webinar, we have a lot of different backgrounds. Some are very familiar with human trafficking and issues around it, and some are not as, as aware. Um, so we wanna make sure that everyone here has a, a starting knowledge of some of the myths and realities of human trafficking. I'm hoping that for those of you who are experienced in the field, maybe the way I present it um, will be something that you wanna use. Maybe you wanna use my slides. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help you share um, and spread community awareness, let us know. Um, so we wanna share some of the things that we're doing at the Office of the Attorney General. The first thing we're trying to do is make sure that everyone understands what human trafficking is. Human trafficking is a crime that involves exploiting a person for forced labor, forced services, or commercial sex. And the key elements of trafficking are force, fraud, coercion, or when a minor is under uh, 18 uh, and it involves sexual exploitation. The big myth that we see is that trafficking involves smuggling people across a border. And I know that those of you who are familiar with trafficking see and hear that all the time. The reality, of course, is that trafficking is uh, compelled labor or commercial sex. It doesn't even require movement. Um, it involves both citizens and non-citizens. It's a crime against human rights. And smuggling is an entirely separate crime of transporting a willing person across borders. This brings us to the second poll. Um, and I did want to uh, share that because this um, will let us know kind of what your experience and what kind of trafficking you are seeing um, and, and your part of um, addressing human trafficking issues. So if you will answer one more question for me, I'd really appreciate it. All right, that has been a minute of response. Hopefully we got yours in. Um, you will see that our majority here is child sex domestic, um, but we do have people um, who are serving our um, trafficking victims all across the state and all of these different ways. Um, and we really do appreciate all of the um, efforts that are being made in this field. Another myth is that I'm sure you hear, especially those of you who are dealing with um, sex trafficking of minors, that's traffickers snatch up unsuspecting victims. And we know that the reality is that traffickers often meet their victims online using apps and making false promises. We also hear the myth that trafficking, uh, traffickers are kidnapping children and locking them in cages and chains. And we know that instead, traffickers generally lure their victims by false promises of safety, love, and income. They keep their, visit, their victims through emotional and physical abuse and ma manipulation. And it's also important to remember that traffickers can be family members um, and acquaintances. Uh, we see this, um, the media sometimes sees this as a stranger crime. And of course we know that it's not. My chief, uh, Kara Pierce was not able to be with us today but she wanted to address a couple of the myths as well. Hello everyone. I'm so sorry I couldn't join you all today. Thank you so much for your interest in human trafficking. It's especially important right now during January, which is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Um, and I hope to see you at the next webinar in person. Well, virtual. I wanted to talk about this particular myth because this is one that I've seen a lot recently in my job here at the AG's office. The myth is that trafficking doesn't happen in my community. Trafficking is a problem that happens somewhere else that only happens in the big city or that only happens um, in, in the countryside. That's not correct. Trafficking happens everywhere in Texas. So it's very hard to fully quantify the problem and the number of trafficking victims, but one of the easiest ways to compare Texas to other states in the country is to look at the number of reported trafficking incidents uh, that were reported to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. And Texas consistently ranks 
second highest in the nation for number of reports to the trafficking hotline. In 2018, there were over 2,100 suspected trafficking victims that were identified through um, hotline calls and over 700 traffickers. In 2019, the number went up and over 2,400 victims were um, identified through calls to the national hotline. Texas consistently is the second worst in the country for number of human trafficking cases. And I, I also want to highlight an astounding number that happened during 2020. In 2020, when so many businesses were struggling and um, the economy slowed down quite a bit, trafficking flourished. In fact, there were over 1.6 million online commercial sex ads in 2020 posted in the state of Texas. 1.6 million. And something to think about that, that makes it even worse is each of those ads likely resulted in more than one commercial sex act. People who post those online commercial sex ads, often the people are traffickers that do the posting, hope to get five commercial sex transactions or more off of those ads. So the numbers really are astounding. And of those 1.6 million, over 200,000 of those ads are believed to have offered children um, for sale for sex. So this is a problem that is that is huge and even during the pandemic is, is a huge problem here in the state. Um, I'm pleased to announce that the Texas Attorney General's Office is launching a new campaign called Texans are not for sale. Um, we are doing everything in our power to raise awareness and to this issue and to educate people about these issues so that they can help um, support uh, anti-trafficking efforts in their community. Um, we are doing everything we can. We are going to be pushing out a lot of information about how Texans are not for sale and Texas kids are not for sale. Texas women are not for sale and Texas workers are not for sale in hopes that in 2021 we don't have 1.6 million online commercial sex ads in Texas. We want that number to go down as we want the number of victims in the state to go down. Another myth that's, that's important to dispel is that individuals, just normal community members, can't do anything about trafficking. I've talked to people before who say things like, well, Kara, you know, you're out there helping and, and law enforcement's out there helping, but what can I do? I can't do anything. I'm, I'm just a school teacher or a business person. Well, the truth is anyone can help with trafficking. You can make a difference. Um, you're about to see a news, uh, video clip of some people who saw something that wasn't correct in their community. They knew something wasn't right. They reported it and they made a difference. Thank you. It's a planned community. So the bottom line is that everybody that came here was a suburbia. It was, you know, attracted families. That was the whole idea of the woodland. So it does tend to be very quiet, relatively boring, and a lot of people call it a bubble. This street specifically with only the six houses, yes. we're usually just sitting out here with the kids playing around. So if there is ever a car that comes in, which is only really four families that ever come in or out, um, we get up and we move. So it's a huge difference when there's multiple cars coming in yes. all the time, like we're constantly getting up and getting down. For the most part, you know every person that's coming by and if there's a strange car, everyone that's sitting out here, we're all sort of, you know, who, who is that? So I got tired of walking to the window every 30 minutes and taking photos with my iPhone of the cars coming and going. We had gotten our father-in-law a deer cam and I set it up and after the first day I came in and I put the memory card in and I think it was like 42 cars had come in and out of our street. This car is interesting because it was the owners of the house and they would come um, once a week to drop off groceries. And that was probably the only car that you would notice um, again and again. It was amazing to see all of the high-end cars coming in, Porsches to Maseratis to broken down pickup trucks to cars with stickers that their children were on the honor roll at our local school. I did a very simple search. All I did was search for the house um, and I came across an ad on backpage.com and actually on this page I typed in rolling mill and sure enough it came up 
you know, just a simple search of the woodlands even today, you're going to find um, escorts and all kinds of things. But it was very alarming to see my street name on here with this ad with these um, women and the services that they were providing. It was um, quite shocking. the neighbors started contacting the sheriff's office and started saying, hey, there's something wrong with this house. There's something not right. There's a lot of men going in and out. There's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of traffic uh, after hours, which is very unusual in this neighborhood because this house is located on a cul-de-sac. I can recall calling my supervisor and telling him, you're not gonna believe this. We have a human trafficking case in the woodlands. One of the realities that we discovered during the investigation is these women being held against their will were being raped daily over and over again at this residence. They'd pull in and um, then another car would pull in and they'd wait and the one car would back out and it was a constant flow of um, traffic. It was like, like a locust. They just kept coming and coming. And then when we knew exactly what was happening in there with these women, it, it was really disheartening, especially having two daughters. It's very frightening. And we realized that these, these same girls were being transferred, not only in Montgomery County, but also to Harris County and being sold in other locations for sex over and over again, from one spot to another spot. And this led to an even larger investigation that we discovered was in New York. And we discovered that these women were being brought in for this purpose from China. And we have another breaking news alert out of Montgomery County. Four arrests linked to a human trafficking bust. They discovered four different locations the girls were being taken to. Prosecutors say in this case they found eight victims, women who are Chinese nationals around 20 to 30 years old. We're our brother's keeper. We're supposed to watch out for each other. And that's what these neighbors did. And they shut down an organization that was a multi-million dollar organization that did nothing but hurt people. The day that I was watching the news and I saw the bust had happened, I was ecstatic. With one phone call, he literally changed everything. All right, thank you, Brooke. Um, so I wanted to use this opportunity. We have, like I said, a lot of really fantastic subject matter experts um, who can provide some of their perspectives. So right now I wanna open it up to our panelists, um, DFPS, HHSC, TGLR, um, Becca, if you also wanna kind of speak into this and jump into this, um, please do. Maybe you can speak to um, what are some ways that um, some of these uh, uh, people on the webinar can can make a difference or what have you seen that can really help in the prevention efforts for human trafficking? Um, hi, this is Brandy um, with the Health and Human Services Commission. I operate the Human Trafficking Resource Center here. And um, so depending on, well, as a community member, um, anyone, uh, that was a clip from the, uh, the Attorney General's office, Be the One, uh, in the fight against human trafficking video. And there is a lot of really great information in there about what community members can do, how they can recognize and respond to human trafficking in their communities. So I highly recommend um, viewing that video if you haven't, it's about an hour long um, and can be found anywhere on the internet if you, um, if you, if you uh, Google be the one uh, human trafficking. Um, and it's also on our, our webpage and the attorney general's webpage, it's everywhere. Um, so that's a really great start if you want um, kind of a, a broad picture. Um, and then uh, from my agency's perspective, we have, there's a legislation in 2019 requiring um, all healthcare providers um, to, when they're renewing their licenses to take a training that's approved by uh, my agency. And so if you're a healthcare provider, and I know that there's some on here, um, feel free to, you can, um, you can find a list of those approved trainings um, that specifically speak about what healthcare providers can do um, to prevent and um, recognize and report also um, human trafficking and in their 
uh, work environment, their work setting, healthcare setting. Um, and then there's also um, my, my resource center will um, kind of answer on a case by case basis if you have questions about um, you know, what kind of uh, awareness campaigns are there in my area? How can I get, can I volunteer? Um, which is kind of complicated right now because of uh, COVID, but there are workarounds and there are still people that absolutely need for volunteers um, out there. Um, and also uh, we can help you find um, like posters or, you know, uh, other kinds of stuff like that so that in your area uh, so that you can put them up in wherever you, wherever you need to, wherever you want. Um, so that's kind of our take on it. Thank you, Brandy. That's perfect. Um, Dimitri or Blanca or Anna or Catherine, um, do you have anything to, yeah, to add? Please feel free to jump in. Yes, Emily. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, Commissioner Masters sends her, her kind regards. She was on another, another call. Um, I think DFPS is fortunate that we have so many amazing partners and we have inroads almost with every multiple disciplinary that we work with and our dedication to human trafficking is first and foremost. Um, we have instilled a culture of being there for no matter what. If there's someone that's on the side of the road at three o'clock in the morning with a child and no one knows who, they, who the child belongs to, we want to get involved. Uh, we look forward to working with everybody. We, we, we love being a part of the coordinating council and the best part about it is as we looked at this realistically, uh, before COVID, we, everybody said that most of these kids were our kids. So we, 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 we accepted our challenge and we worked with law enforcement, our partners, and we actually did runaway recovery efforts and we recovered a lot of people. Uh, obviously, we only have jurisdiction in certain settings, but those youth that were not in our, in our jurisdiction, we made sure that they got to, to an actual family member so they wouldn't be alone. So, the FPS is excited about being here. Um, uh, we have our director of human trafficking and our director of faith base. Uh, I'll defer to them, but I'll be here for a little bit longer if there's anybody in the audience that, ha that has any questions for me. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Dimitri. That's perfect. Um, Blanca or Anna, feel free to jump in and cut me off if you want to. I'm, I'm Blanca Denise Lance. I'm the director of human trafficking with the Department of Family and Protective Services, and thank you. Uh, Emily and the Office of Attorney General for including us in this in this great work. Um, I think one of the key things that we talk about is our partnership is becoming aware of what your role is and within your community and to start to dispel and really look at those myths as you've laid out in your in your PowerPoint is to really start to break down the fact that this really does exist everywhere um, in different nuances with different age ranges with different uh, populations and so it's important for individuals to recognize that this is happening um, in every community, whether it's small or large, um, and it's happening at different rates and in, in, by different or, you know, systems and processes, whether it be gang trafficking or, or uh, what's considered third party or exploitation processes. And so it's really looking at the issue and becoming aware of it, being able to identify the flags, the red flags, and just helping to dispel the myths that this is not happening in, in your own community because it really is everywhere. That's perfect. And I'm gonna loop back um, with you guys in just a second and we can talk a little bit about who are some of the victims as a way to kind of dispel some of the myths. And I think that DFPS, you guys might be able to provide a really good insight. Perfect, Brooke, thank you. Um, so I think this is a perfect kind of transition for if you guys wanna to speak to, I know Dimitri, you were talking about some of your recoveries, but um, you know, what can some of the people who are watching this webinar, what are some ways that they can identify and address some uh, risk and protective factors or who are the victims that we're talking about? Now, I'll, I'll chime in real fast before I get off the call. Uh, the victims are everybody. It's, it's your neighbor, it's the person that's working at the convenience store, the hair salon, and I think the most important thing people see and they say, well, maybe not. So I know this is kind of cliche, but if you see something, say something. Uh, we have a, a wonderful relationship with law enforcement. The fusion center is amazing. And that, that tip that you see, even if it's a partial license plate, may mean nothing today. But next month, it may actually help them make a case, much like the family you saw in the, in the woodlands. Um, everything, every tip matters. Reach out to us. Call our hotline. Just report it. Great. Thank you. 
And I mean, I think what's what's I think Dimitri touched on this. One of the things that we have focused so much on the coordinate council is actually coordinating our efforts. We have arms and law enforcement, obviously prosecution with the AG's office, and then we have preventative and providing services to the victims as well. And so it's important that just as we are working together and coordinating and collaborating our efforts, that you all become part of that process so we can really address this on all parts of the spectrum, on all different touch points that we have to really uh, make sure that we are tackling this issue at every um, potential point. All right, Brooke, I can, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Okay. So another par important part of preventing um, from the strategic plan is to reduce demand. Um, and I think that especially when we're talking about um, sex trafficking, we really have to look at um, what are we doing statewide to address demand. Um, and a few things that, the, that we've noted, uh, high frequency buyers make up disproportionately large shares of the illegal sex trade. Um, and that's been true for many years now. I've seen research for um, at least five and maybe even up to 10 years that, um, that really the buyer, pro there's two buyer problems. One is the um, low frequency, um, but uh, majority of the buyers. But the huge problem is the high frequency buyers um, who are online all the time um, looking, for, um, looking for women to buy. Um, estimates of the U.S. commercial sex trade, of course, aren't uh, are a guess, especially when we're talking about um, illegal uh, illegal sex trade. Um, but it's at least 5.7 billion, um, and uh, I don't think that I've seen anything that says specifically what Texas is. But we have to know that Texas's numbers are high. Um, the problem is that buyers see prostitution as a victimless cr crime and do not believe that anyone is harmed. But the other problem is that um, studies show that even when buyers um, are informed um, that prostitution uh, does often involve um, victims, they still uh, continue to buy, they still continue to um, purchase uh, sex. Um, from even potentially trafficking victims. So um, just an awareness, uh, which uh, many cities have been doing, a cease, uh, cease operation um, awareness activity that victims of, um, that victims can be, uh, that, that the buyers can be buying sex trafficking victims, that's not enough. We have to do further to reduce demand. We also must assess statewide the prevention landscape um, because human trafficking is interconnected with other kinds of violence. Um, it's interconnected with child abuse. It's interconnected with sexual assault. It's interconnected with intimate partner violence. And in fact, as a prosecutor, I often saw human trafficking um, first come into the, um, the law enforcement or the legal system in other ways. So it was first reported as a child abuse, or it was first reported as a sex assault, or it was first reported as a, as a domestic violence case. So we really have to make sure that when we're talking about trafficking, we are getting the word out statewide um, that you are going to see trafficking within other reports, that it may not um, self-identify as a trafficking victim, um, and yet this person may uh, be someone who needs um, trafficking services. And so one of the things I think we have to look at is what prevention tactics are in your community that address um, human trafficking education. And Blanca, Thank you, it looks like you might have something to share. Perfect. Yeah, I think in this, when we're talking about community awareness, one of the key things that we can be talking about from a prevention standpoint is when you look at child abuse, sexual assault, and intimate partner violence intersections, is that what we're really looking at is healthy boundaries and healthy relationships. And if we're going to move the needle in human trafficking, we really need to work to address what is a healthy relationship and um, relationships that protect one another and do not um, cause harm to one another. And that's a really first good step in early education to really address some of these longstanding issues that happen um, in, in the intersections of sexual assault and intimate partner violence and child abuse. Absolutely, thank you. Emily, did you have anything else before I move on? That's perfect, I'm just gonna do a hand off with Blanca, so please continue. Excellent. So we also need statewide prevention framework and guidelines. Um, we need to develop prevention strategies and program providers for human trafficking victims must have foundational knowledge 
a trafficking skill set and capacity. And I know that the governor's office has worked particularly hard with many of our nonprofits across the state um, to develop that um, that foundational knowledge and the trafficking skill set to make sure that they. Uh, the goal is, of course, to have um, people with the foundational knowledge and the trafficking skill set across the state. Um, and I know that the governor's office has been instrumental um, in building that along with the rest of the coordinating council. And then there has to be coordination. And I know that this is one area that um, the Attorney General's Office uh, Human Trafficking Prevention Task Force is wanting to make sure that we build coordination across the state. Um, it is uh, one of our goals to make sure that if you are a care provider in El Paso and you have information about something that's happening in Amarillo or in Houston or in um, uh, uh, Rio Grande Valley, that you have someone to contact. And I believe that um, the task force's goal is to build that um, cohesion and that coordination. Brooke, I'd also like to add, this is Anna Blake with Faith-Based and Community Engagement here at the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, um, that in coordination with the governor's office and the task force, we've been working um, really hard, particularly in the area of faith-based and our faith-based partnerships to ensure that first our faith-based partners know how to identify the signs of human trafficking and then how to report and where to report and to whom to report um, those particular incidences too. And we've uh, received remarkable uh, feedback and interest, ongoing interest in wanting to develop more understanding as to how the faith community in particular can respond in a way not only to prevent and educate um, clergy and, and those in the congregation, but as well as to support victims. Um, they really want to be a part of the solution in helping victims um, that are identified um, in this space uh, recover and, and really flourish after experiencing such uh, deep traumas that can last um, often lifelong um, and, and often even generational without the right response and, and trauma-informed um, types of responses. So I wanted to add that our faith partners are essential in this work and they've really stepped up um, and um, are a key stakeholder in what we see as the solution to combating this uh, heinous crime. I think that shows how our prevention piece and our part four, so come back in for every week, but come back for part four, especially because then we're gonna be talking about that providing support. And I think that those two really go in hand in hand because we have to have statewide prevention efforts as well as statewide support efforts. So one of the other um, strategies is to reduce vulnerabilities. Um, we know that uh, men, women, and children can all be victims of human trafficking, but we also do know that vulnerable populations can include um, those who are impoverished, um, children who have run away from home, um, victims of physical and sexual abuse, um, drug addicts and alcoholics. Those are uh, vulnerabilities that can um, increase the likelihood that someone um, becomes a sex trafficking victim or a trafficking victim. And so we reduce vulnerabilities with economic empowerment. Um, we reduce vulnerabilities by uh, prevention education that's targeted to our populations with higher vulnerabilities, um, which I think is what Anna was kind of just describing. You know, if we are doing some specific um, training towards those who are um, involved in um, faith-based foster care or um, other forms of, um, of contact with DFPS, then we are targeting our prevention towards those who we believe could have an enhanced vulnerability. Um, and then of course we need to encourage and help um, folks develop healthy and supportive relationships. Another strategy is to utilize school-based prevention education. I know that there is being a lot being done currently um, to reach out to um, coordinate with the schools to make sure that we are um, uh, providing uh, research-based education designing, designed to prevent sexual child abuse of children and trafficking. Um, we, have, we are working towards a statewide PTA uh, program for parents. And then once that's developed, we plan to introduce one for high school kids as well. Um, and TEA is also reporting on, or is also developing reporting and awareness guidance um, so that all of our schools across the state will know when to call and who to call if they suspect trafficking in our schools. So 
So Emily, yeah, I wanted to turn it back over to you. Perfect, thank you, Brooke. Um, so now we have a really great um, opportunity. Um, we have Becca Charleston here from the Human Trafficking Survivor Leaders Council. Um, so Becca, I'm gonna let you pass this off to you and you can provide your perspective um, to some of the things that, that we've addressed. Perfect, thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to kind of dovetail off everyone else's comments and just talk about the importance of to continue doing what you're doing, right? You're, you're educating yourself right now, you're listening, and we hope that it doesn't stop there, that you turn around and then talk to other people about it. Your neighbor, right? Your pastor, whoever, your hair salon stylist. Um, it's so important. And it's really important to continue educating yourself. Uh, the Polaris Project, who runs the National Human Trafficking Hotline, put out this report. I just put, dropped it in the chat to everyone. But there's more than 25 different types of human trafficking that have been identified in America. And so it's really important to understand that you know, it can look really different. All the victims, all the perpetrators look really vastly different across each different type. And so, you know, we could be missing a lot if all we're thinking about is uh, a, a prostituted person and a pimp, you know, if, if we're not thinking about familial or right, the other ways that it can look. So I just implore you to continue educating yourself. And since I'm here on behalf of a, a larger council than myself, I am going to read you guys a, a disclaimer and let you know who else is on the council. They will be um, on the next several weeks. We'll have a different survivor leader on each call. So you'll be able to meet some of, or you know, at least see some of them. And I'll let you know what our mission and vision is. So the views, opinions, thoughts, and statements contained herein belong solely to the authors represented by the Human Trafficking Survivor Leaders Council and not necessarily to the authors, employers, organizations, companies, committees, or groups that the authors are affiliated with. It is important to note that the Human Trafficking Survivor Leader, Leaders Council is a collaborative comprised of survivor leaders and experts with different lived experiences, hence different views, opinions, thoughts, the Human Trafficking Survivor Leaders Council does not assume to represent the opinions, views, and thoughts of all survivors of human trafficking. The council members, our coordinating leader is Sophia Strother. She has her MBA. She is affiliated with Empowerment Driven by Knowledge Coalition. Brooke Axtell is affiliated with Freedom United. She is rising in TASA. Becca Carey is affiliated with uh, Hands of Justice. Myself, I'm affiliated with The Jensen Project and Valiant Hearts. Uh, Rachel Fisher is an RN and she's affiliated with Street Grace. Allie Franklin is affiliated with Safe Austin. Ava Hartley is affiliated with Severa Wellness. Catherine McGibbon Givens is affiliated with 1211 Partners. Tony McKinley is affiliated with Magdalene House. Lisa Michelle is affiliated with No Strings Attached. Carla Solomon is affiliated with A21 Freedom Chasers. Roy Moss Youth Alternatives and Mercy Gate Ministries. And finally, Sandy Storm is affiliated with Deliver Fund. Our mission is to review, recommend, and develop survivor informed policies and best practices that address commercial sexual exploitation and human trafficking across the state of Texas. Our vision is to see cultural change and sustainable practices that enhance efforts to end commercial sexual exploitation and human trafficking. Whew, that was a mouthful. Thanks for letting me get through that. <laughs> So now to the slide, um, you know, really when it, a few key takeaways uh, after we had the opportunity to review um, this presentation and propose legislation and um, the governor's office tactics in conjunction with all the parties represented here. And a few key takeaways is that a prevention approach can unintentionally shift the blame if we're not careful. You know, we all know that vulnerabilities don't actually cause the trafficking. Buyers and traffickers are the root cause of human trafficking. And so, you know, it's it's very akin. We, we have to make sure that when we're educating people, um, which everyone has done such a wonderful job at today, that we don't unintentionally begin victim blaming, right? That the length of my skirt should, doesn't prevent me from getting raped, you know, and, and we all know that to be true, but we have to make sure that we, um, you know, when we're educating the kids that we're not just educating women to not become victims, right? We're educating boys, or, or I should have said girls, we're educating young boys on how to value people, right? And, and young girls as well. 
uh, that people are not commodities, uh, that people that come from different backgrounds than us should not be seen as less than or dehumanized. Um, prevention education should include material on gender-based violence as well as power dynamics. You know, if we're not teaching uh, on power dynamics, people will unassumingly get caught up in some of these situations when you don't understand. Uh, you know, I, I think when you introduce an influencer as powerful as money, right, choice goes out the window. And so if we're not looking and educating on uh, vulnerabilities, as was mentioned by Brooke, uh, that we're, we're really going to be missing the mark. It's also really important to highlight that vulnerable populations disproportionately include people of color and LGBTQ plus youth and the prevention landscape must take this into consideration. And so do our materials represent those populations? Number one, as, as nonprofits and leaders, people that are hopefully educating the rest of the state of Texas, you know, do we only have the white girl painted as the victim? Because that is a travesty. There's, there's a huge problem, uh, the disproportionality of, uh, you know, non-white uh, people of color uh, that are trafficked. And if we're never seeing them painted, or we're not receiving, seeing them represented as the victim, we're doing a disservice to everyone. And so, especially LGBTQ, it's especially important that people understand that boys can be victims of human trafficking, obviously labor and sex as well. So lastly, Prevention education must include online safety and age-appropriate awareness of online exploitation, revenge exploitation, and grooming tactics, including case studies where, when appropriate. Obviously, for middle school, high school age children, they need to understand, you know, that guy that just messaged you and you know thinks you're really cute may be that may be the start of grooming. And we all know, you know, with 2020 having knocked us all. <laughs> at home, uh, that all the kids are online and they're at even greater uh, risk of uh, potentially becoming exploited because traffickers have now moved from the streets, which there's still street activity, but they have moved to sitting in, on Instagram and Facebook and right OnlyFans. And I mean, just every platform that our children are on, traffickers are on as well, intentionally trying to lure victims. So it's really important that our prevention education in school remains current with what's going on in society to, uh, to address those issues and vulnerabilities. Thank you, Becca. We are so fortunate to have you um, kind of speak to this. And as coordinating council, we were very lucky to have the Human Trafficking Survivor Leader Council come in and kind of break down the strategic plan and use them kind of in a consulting manner and make sure that what we're talking about on ways to um, eradicate human trafficking from their perspective, what are we missing? What are some gaps that maybe are falling through? So um, kind of having this dialogue perspective is integral in this um, kind of fight to charting it in. So thank you, Becca, for your time. We really appreciate it. All right, um, and now I'm gonna move to kind of our action plan. So this is a very high level of here are the high points that we touched in our strategic plan on ways to um, hit the first pillar of prevent in charting an into human trafficking. Um, Blanca, I'm gonna hand this back to you and maybe you can lead us and kind of summarize what we talked about today. There we go. Um, so one of the key things was that we really talked about enhancing community awareness. You know, we have to we have to fight the myths, we have to get the truth out, and we have to really focus on recognizing that this happens everywhere in every community. No community is, you know, uh, immune to this circumstance. And once you recognize that, then you're able to put um, your knowledge into action. And that helps us to identify and address our risk and protective factors and really work to um, reduce demand, support legislation that penalizes buyers as, as well as the traffickers and that it's not just a one-sided approach, but that when you address the buyer uh, penalties as well, that that allows for um, curbing behavior for those who may not be the high frequency buyers, um, as well as assess the prevention landscape. What is already working in your community? There's a lot of community partners that exist that are doing their part and really work at that multidisciplinary approach and collaborative approach to join your forces and, and really compound your efforts into an effective strategy within your community. And develop, a, you know, to help develop statewide prevention framework and guidelines, assist with recognizing that there has to be common knowledge, 
common um, application and making sure that we're not um, losing the sight of survivor voice who helps assist with that process. Help us to reduce vulnerabilities. It takes a community, it takes a village. It requires all of us to address this in a very public health approach in that no one entity can do this alone. We need you, survivors need you, our victims need you, and we need to move the work forward. And really work to, on the prevention side is really look at that front end prevention and work to, to uh, partner with your school-based organizations, your PTAs, your local school districts, and find out what they're doing and how you can support the work that they're, they're working in providing prevention education, not just within the staff, but amongst the, the, the membership, the school membership, and, and the parents, as well as the youth and children. And so through that collaborative approach, we're really able to then address it at all levels so that we're not just working on the back end uh, of this tra traumatic crime, but we're getting ahead of it from the front end and working on it from an upstream perspective. And hopefully we bookend it on both ends to really work to eradicate this as a team. Thank you, Blanca. That's perfect. Um, so now we're going to move to the question and answer section. Um, I've seen some of you have posted your question. If you haven't or if you have a lingering question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box and we'll hopefully address it if we have enough time. Um, I first, we got a few questions and I know our time is running short, so I want to kind of jump in. Um, one of the questions that we received was, um, what is the best place or how is the best way to report suspicious activity and or license plates? I'm going to hand this over to Dimitri with DFPS. He might be able to address this question. Thank you, Emily. That's a, that's a great question. It just depends on what are you reporting. If you think it's something that could be imminent, then I suggest you call 911 without a doubt. Uh, unfortunately, these traffickers, they move often. So if you think someone's been trafficked, please call 911. Uh, if it's just a general one before license plate, most large departments such as DPS, they have an online version to, re to report, which is called iWatch, and I'm sure Austin Police Department, so most large, larger organizations have those. Uh, in other ways, obviously, you can report to DFPS for any child. You can use that 1-800 number as well as utilize the online reporting. But as we spoke earlier, in the, uh, earlier when we started this, the most important thing is to say something. And it may not seem to be anything at the moment, but months and months down the line, there's a good opportunity that you can actually help save somebody. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, this sure. is a kind of a big follow-up question, and I encourage any of our panelists on this call to kind of jump in. Um, we just received this question kind of, this is, we've talked about all the things that Texas is doing well in this effort. What are some things um, that Texas is doing wrong? Or what do you think are the biggest opportunities for growth that Texas has in this fight? I'll jump in as a survivor. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I was excited to join the council to work on is uh, the fact that we're still arresting women for our people being sold in prostitution. I think I would love to see the state of Texas be one of the first states in America to accept, you know, or to uh, in, put in place equality model legislation, which means that we would no longer arrest prostituted people, thereby criminalizing them, but we would continue to go after the buyers and the traffickers and brothel owners that are the root cause of this issue. Thank you, Becca. And I know you have particularly some really insightful kind of expertise with some of the work that you're doing on the side regarding legislation. Um, and I want to follow up. There's another question we, we see, and maybe it's, it's more of a statement, but I think maybe with your specific background, I know with what you've been working on, you might have some really helpful insight. Um, so we have a follow-up kind of statement that says, buyers see prostitution as a victim of crime and do not believe anyone is harmed. Buyers also see related non-crimes, i.e. pornography, as victimless. In addition, many sex workers see themselves as non-victims. I believe that is related and none of this can be victim, victimless as a result. Um, can you kind of expound on your experience and, and background? Yeah, I think that was a, a great statement. And I honestly 100% agree. Uh, as someone that was, you know, trafficked from, from being a runaway as a kid, uh, and I was in exploitation, um, both with multiple traffickers, as well as staying in by myself, because I had incurred, uh, you know, all debt in my name, you know, uh, uh, criminal history, you know, being arrested multiple times, having a federal felony. And so it becomes 
uh, this self-deprecating cycle that you can't get out of once you once you are criminalized. But I totally agree to speak more to that comment um, that anyone that is put in the position, you know, when we look at research uh, from prostituted people that has been done across the world, Melissa Bartley is one such researcher, uh, you know, people that get caught up in prostitution uh, typically come from, you know, terrible backgrounds. They were sexually abused as children, uh, potentially the foster care system, uh, runaways like myself. Uh, it could be anywhere from, you know, your, your average Sally Sue to, you know, someone that came out of poverty and homelessness. And so it's really important to understand when you get to the point in your life where you feel like your only option is to sell yourself. And as I talked about earlier, once, once you bring money to the table for a sex transaction, uh, that really choice goes out the window because at the end of the day, if I cannot uh, feed my kids, if I cannot pay my bills, if I don't have uh, give you sexual services, then that's not really choice. That's still, uh, we want to be able to reach that person and offer them services and a way out instead of a, a criminal record uh, and we want to offer them things that can truly empower them. Great, 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 great. Um, speaking of kind of empowerment and um, kind of you were talking about some, doing some research, we see uh, there's a couple of questions to talk about. Where's the data that shows or can we can we show some of the audience members on the data that shows buyers online are more than just a casual es escort customer? Or what of other case studies can be found about online safety, grooming techniques, or human trafficking statistics? And I can open this up to all panelists. Emily, so one of the partners um, in Texas that is received a grant from the governor's office, child sex trafficking team, is Children at Risk, who is working on CEASE Texas. And they're tracking, and they have some interesting data trends um, regarding, um, regarding what they're seeing on the buyer, buyer side of things and some patterns and behaviors. And so um, I can make available to send out, uh, we did a presentation with uh, children at risk at the beginning of the month for Human Trafficking Awareness Month. We are going to make it as an uh, on-demand option. And so we can share that uh, for people who have missed it. And that really goes through some of the patterns and, and uh, trends that they're seeing with regards to buyers. Great, thank you, Blanca. Anyone else wanna to speak to this question or we can move on to the next one? I will say it's something I think we're continuing to work on is the, I think that the research side of the trafficking field is in its infancy. Um, there are some, there are many um, uh, folks in education across the state who are working on this. In fact, there's a, um, a whole team of folks who are doing research on, on trafficking issues. Um, I hope that this is something we will see more of in the next few years um, because I do think it's something we need. We need. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know that some of our efforts for sure um, are making sure that we coordinate and get these statistics out there. Um, you know, we've started, I think Brooke had talked about this in the beginning, but, you know, there are some flyers that we have with some of these numbers. Um, but a lot of this uh, information, as you can imagine, we're trying to give them from different pieces and DPS figures. And then we have DFPS's information and making sure we coordinate that um, altogether, but it is an active thing that we're working on, but we're very fortunate that we have a lot of NGOs working on this issue on the, on the um, kind of boots on the ground and getting this information. We hope to continue to expound on the, on this uh, statistics. Um, one of, this might be a good kind of question to end on, um, in light of kind of what's been happening lately, we got a big overall question, just what can be done to shed light on the real issues of trafficking? while preventing disinformation or misinformation? I do think that's really important and that's part of the reason we started with that. Um, hopefully, perhaps you got some tools. If you want these slides, email us. Um, our uh, email address will be in the chat shortly. Um, and um, I'm happy to share slides or ideas uh, with anyone. Um, I'm working on some training stuff with the Office of the Attorney General, and I'm happy to um, share that with you. I do, I think that we have to continue to um, 
educate and re-educate and re-educate. And when we speak on trafficking, we have to, I think, start from an assumption that maybe someone might have heard something that's incorrect. Um, so when we go to a community group, we have to um, start with a um, uh, start with an assumption that we all need to get on the same page as to what trafficking is and, and where we're seeing it. Right. Thank you, Brooke. Um, and just kind of as we're wrapping up, I just want to bring your attention. We have a posting in the, um, um, I guess, the chat box. But just to finally, thank you all for your participation. If you have any further um, information, yes, please find us on social media. We have a Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter account, which is a very new thing. Um, and then if you are looking for um, more information, please feel free to email us at humantrafficking at oag.texas.gov. Um, as you can see, a poll has also popped up. We'd like to kind of get your feedback. This is obviously our first one that we've done as a coordinating council. Um, and just let us know kind of your thoughts on this, our first web webinar. Um, and as a reminder, these webinars, this is the first of a series of five. So we will see you hopefully next Tuesday, um, same time, 12 p.m., log on um, and we will talk about protect and we will have a whole new group of speakers. Thank you again for your time and we hope to see you then.